morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Preaching in the Park. I'm your host, Minister Jonathan Simmons, and we thank God for those of you who decided to join us here on this beautiful morning here, beautiful uh, Saturday, Sunday morning, and we thank God for those of you who decided to join us here in this day. And we thank you again for this day, because this is the day that the Lord hath made, and we will be glad and rejoice in it. And we are very, very thankful that we're out here again. I'm going to adjust my camera here a little bit. There we go. So we can be seen a little bit better. Again, we just thank God for those of you who decided to tune in and join us here this morning. Uh, again, this is a wonderful morning, beautiful morning here in uh, College Park, technically. We're just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, maybe 20 minutes away from uh, downtown Atlanta, maybe less than that. And as you can hear in the background from time to time, we're just minutes away from uh, Hartsfield Jackson Airport. Again, uh, the busiest airport in the world as far as traffic. But like I said, again, we just thank God. I always thank God for being able to come out here uh, into the park uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, as I mentioned in previous broadcasts, just coming through here through a residential area, it's such a nice area. The homes are nice. And on days like today, we have another day where it had rained previously. And the nice thing about that, you know, rain has a way of washing things away, making everything nice and clean and, and bright. And so, uh, again, we're just excited to be uh, out here in the middle of it. And uh, we're going to start the broadcast. We're running a little bit late today. Um, we ask you to bear with us and be patient with us as we start the broadcast. But again, we're just excited to be here. I'm not going to make any more excuses. I'm just going to thank the Lord that I'm here. I thank the Lord that he gives me a perseverance and gives you the perseverance to hang in with us uh, no matter what. And again, so many of you people have uh, told me that you've seen me, seen the broadcast, and that you enjoy the broadcast. So we are committed to come out here and bring this broadcast each and every week. Sometimes I will say it is a little bit uh, easier than other days, but we don't care about that. I just thank God that I'm here. Thank God I'm in the land of living. Thank God I have my life, health, and strength. And thank God that, again, uh, those of you who are watching this broadcast or listening to it via podcast, we thank you, thank you, and thank you very much for all of it and all of your support. So today, um, I'm going to talk about what's next, what's next. And one of the things that is very, very important in this day and time, it's important all the time, is to, for us to practice what we preach. Now, those of you who know me, you know I tell you all the time that this thing is easier to teach and preach than it is to live it. <laughs> the reason why it is because we're all in this human condition, all these human bodies. Uh, matter of fact, that, uh, you know, uh, Paul calls it uh, jars of clay. Uh, such as this great, the Holy Spirit, all this thing that God is doing with us, but yet we are in these, these earthen vessels or jars of clay. What does that mean? Simply just means that um, we some folks, <laughs> that's just plain and way as I can say, I can say it. We are people, we are human beings, uh, we're walking through this earth and we are subject because of we are in these cases, in these bodies, uh, to, to not want to do, in essence, what the Lord has called us to do. Now, I just want to encourage everybody uh, on this day that we, we continue to focus in on the goodness of the Lord. We continue to focus in on the things that God wants us to do and that we don't get distracted by all the nonsense going on. And most of all, that, like I say again, we begin to actually practice what we preach. Practice what we preach. Because how many people know that once you put it out there that you're a believer, once you put it out there that you're a child of God, you know people are watching you? Right, like right in your own household, our children watch us. You know, children imitate everything that we do. So if we are claiming and professing that we are children of God, we have to be careful that we are, in fact, operating in that space, that we're actually living and walking out the commandments of God. Now, we often think of that of just a series of do's and don'ts, you know, and there is certainly that is involved with it. But a lot of it also is the idea of us not, again, living up and not walking out through the power of God. This is a big thing now, through the power of God, the things that God has commanded us to do. And if we're not careful, what we end up being is hypocrites. I can tell you right now, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Savior and Lord, that's one thing uh, that he shares with his Father. He really dislikes hypocrites. So let's go here to the Word and see what the Word, word says to us in terms of trying to help us to understand the importance of practicing what we preach. Before we do that, let us go uh, quickly to the Lord in prayer. O oh, great mighty Yahweh, maker of heaven and earth, we thank you, O oh, great God, for your loving kindness because it's new each and every morning. And we thank you, Lord, for your mercy because it endures forever. 
We thank you, Lord, great God, for this opportunity to come out before your people to teach and preach. Oh, Lord God, we ask you, Lord, now to let me decrease and you increase through the power of your mighty Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, that your word might go forth with power and clarity. So, Father, we might be doers of the word, not just hearers only. We ask for all these blessings in the name of your Son, mighty Yahashua Mashiach, Jesus who is the Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. So, if we look at the text here, we're going to go, you know, I can do, I have to do Old Testament and New Testament. Let's go to the New Testament first. Uh, we go to Mark chapter 7, 6 and 7. And this is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, speaking to his disciples. And he said, they worship me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. He answered and said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Amen, amen, and amen. Uh, that, that's kind of that's kind of hardcore. And, and elsewhere in scripture, it talks about people have a form of godliness, godliness, but denying the power thereof, from them stay away. It, it's very important that we we really, like I said, do what the Lord commands us to do and really kind of focus more on the compassion and love of people. Now, in, in that particular text, and Mark, I'm gonna pull it up right here. The, what caused Jesus to say that was something that the Pharisees, the religious leaders had come up with. It kind of was like a scam. And, you know, we, we, we kind of taken on some of that stuff today in terms of the way some of us operate in our nonprofits. But that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother can of worms. We'll talk about that some other time. But we go here to, uh, to Mark. I'm going to get with chapter 7 here. I'll pull up here in my Bible. And I'm going to start here with, with verse number 1. So we go to Mark chapter 7, and we'll start verse number 1. So I can give you guys some backstory. On, on this or some context when Jesus is speaking to his disciples that the scripture that you just saw six and seven I'll pop it back up again talk about in vain do they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men he answered and said to them well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites for it is written this people honors me with their lips but their heart is far from me and what made Yeshua HaMashiach say that well that's funny you should ask let's go to the word right here and starting with the first chapter excuse me with the first verse of Mark chapter 7 it said, now the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem. They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Uh, for the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands properly, according to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they did not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe. <laughs> such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. All right, before we go any further, what, what this is talking about here is not just, you know, simply like, you know, your mother and father to you wash your hands. This will be honest. It was a ceremonial washing, and, and they went through this, this uh, grandiose, uh, you know, pouring the water over their hands and, and, you know, sanitizing, you know, with extra cleaning all the bowls and cups. I'm not trying to say it's, it's not a good thing to eat out of clean dishes, but they took this to the next level, okay? It was actually almost obsessive. And it said that the Pharisees and the scribes and asking, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? So that they made it seem like, okay, if your hands weren't washed, you actually were, were defiled. And defiled is a big word. You're talking about a, a spiritual a dirtiness. <laughs> this is what it's saying if you didn't wash your hands before you eat. Okay, and that's what Jesus said to them. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? It is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart's far from me. Well, why is he saying that? Because he said, you leave out the, he said, you leave the commandment of God out and hold the tradition of men. And then he's going to put some on blast. He said, okay. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God to establish your tradition. He said, for Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father and his mother, whatever you have gained from me is Corban. That means it's a gift I'm going to give to God that you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition, which was handed down, and many such things that you do. So there was a scam <laughs> back in those days, and like I said, we, we see it today, that people uh, would say, adult children would say, you know what, I'm not going to take care of my elderly parents anymore because I'm going to give all my wealth to the church. So... In other words, the church then backed him up and said, well, since you're going to do that, you no longer have any responsibility to your parents because you're giving to God and the purpose of God. 
But when the Son of God came, he said, well, that doesn't make any sense. He said, because, in fact, if you said you're serving me, the first commandment with a promise is to honor thy mother, thy father. And what the promise was is that your days shall be long upon the earth. So how on earth can you come up with something, okay, that actually is the exact opposite of what the Word of God said? The Word of God said, take care of your parents, because that's the first way you get a blessing, which is longevity of life. And meanwhile, the religious leaders were saying, well, you, there's, a, there's a loophole that you, you can go through that if you say, hey, I'm going to take this money and I'm actually going to give it to the church, my wealth, then now I don't have to take care of my parents. No, it's all in that picture. But, huh? Where are we going with that? So as you can see, when Jesus came, he wanted to, he didn't want to destroy the law. He said, I didn't come to do that. He said, I came to fulfill the law. So people would say, well, wait a minute, Jesus stood against what the Pharisees were doing. No, he stood against what men were doing. Big difference. And that's where we're at today. See, today we have a lot of things that we do in our churches that have nothing to do, nothing to do with the word of God. That's why there is no power in many of our churches today. You know, it's funny, I was reading in here, uh, in the, reading our Bible, and I looked at the ministry of Yahashua HaMashiach, Jesus, Jesus, who is the Christ. When we look at his ministry, most of his ministry consisted of uh, uh, teaching, preaching, and healing people. He was always meeting the needs of people, wherever their, whatever their needs are. If they needed a financial blessing, if they needed to get fed because they were physically hungry, he took care of that. If they needed to be fed because they were spiritually hungry, he took care of that. And he told the disciples to do the same thing. People that were sick, people that were dying, he used his power to heal the people and then endued, then endued the disciples and commanded them to do the same thing. But today, the emphasis is really about our own personal comfort. It's about what we can do for the church and not what we can do for the church, the ecclesia, the call out one, the, the people of God, which is where we get the word church from, technically. Church has got nothing to do with the building at all. It has everything to do with the people in the building. And what we have done, we have put so much emphasis on the building and on the trappings and, and those types of things that can be visually seen that we neglect to take care of the people of God. You know, we, 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 we have a tendency to look for the loopholes. So that's why I say the first thing is, is let's lock down the loopholes. The first thing we want to do in terms of serving God and spirit and truth and moving away from operating in a hypocritical stance, the first thing we got to do is lock down the loopholes. Get rid of all these loopholes. If you give money to the church, you have to take care of people. You give money to the church, you, know, it, 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 you don't have to pay your bills. Come on, man. That's ridiculous. I mean, all that stuff is, is just of man. That somehow you're a bad person if you're going to give to the church building. They won't pull out uh, these scriptures dealing with, um, you know, how the Lord told the people in the Old Testament that, hey, you live in houses and you live in a plenty and your houses are clean and swept and garnished. And meanwhile, the house of God is in disrepair. OK, first of all, back in those days, they had one temple. <laughs> the, all the people in the nation went to one temple. And that was the place of worship. Today, we got place of worship at every corner. The thing that really gets me, which is amazing, we live in a city, and no disrespect to Atlanta, because most major cities have this problem, crime everywhere. And in some of the worst neighborhoods in cities around the country, you see more churches than anything else. You would think to yourself, with all these churches, man, the folks would be, you, the Holy Ghost would be moving, the people would be different, there would be love abounding, and all that stuff would be gone. But instead, it's not, because... A lot of the churches have nothing to do with the things of God. It's about the tradition of men. It's about uh, this denomination, that denomination. I, think all, I tell people all the time when they ask me, what denomination are you? I say, well, guess what? I'm trying to figure this out. If you can tell me what denomination God is, maybe I will be that denomination. Because guess what? All that stuff is man-made. You know, people talk about Pentecost, and I was raised Pentecostal. People talk about Baptist. I'm a technically licensed Baptist minister. People talk about Methodist. People talk about non-denominational. This is all man-made stuff. You know, there are no denominations in heaven. You know, this is all different man stuff about what they believe God told them is the way to go about their business. I'm not trying to throw shade on anybody at all. But I'm just saying a lot of stuff that we do is man-made. 
I know even growing up in in uh, in the Pentecostal church, they have a rule book, a handbook for the ministers. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with that. You should certainly try to instruct the men and women of God who are carrying the word how to conduct themselves. But they had like all kind of stuff for like um, dress code. Like if you were this level of ministry, you wore this kind of uh, garment and then, you know, you wore this color, collar or shirt. I mean, come on, man. I mean, don't get me wrong. I do believe there are some times where there are some ceremonial way that you should dress. I get it. I mean, if someone's going to a wedding, you certainly don't expect them to come in T-shirt and cutoffs. I get all of that. But sometimes we put so much an emphasis on the external that the internal goes to the hell in the handbasket. Excuse the phrase. And, you know, and don't get me wrong. I, I heard a guy talk about the other day about how God uses all kinds of people. Me and my brother uh, in ministry were talking about that. All that is true. But there also is a certain level of expectation of good behavior. Nobody's perfect. I get it. Nobody's perfect, but we should always be striving, in fact, to be perfect. And perfect doesn't mean necessarily doing everything right all the time, but certainly at the very little, at the very least, to be able to say when you do something wrong, immediately go to God and seek forgiveness. As we say, you say in the church, uh, tell the truth and shame the devil. I mean, that's it. So first thing we want to do is to not be a hypocrite is to really lock down the loopholes. Let's let's get away from these things that we're telling people that somehow would absolve them of their responsibility to mankind by doing something to the church, this institution. And if you're technical, again, reading the Bible, God has got nothing to do with the it has nothing to do with the idea of institutions. He's about the people. We are what? The children of God. Okay? Now, we talk about building. He's talking about this, this body housing the spirit. He's not talking about a building of, with, made with hammer and nail housing the spirit. The spirit of God has to dwell inside us. We are the temple of God, not the building. God has moved us. He's, he's now moved to the next level. It's not just the building. Now, don't get me wrong. It is good to go to a gathering place. It's good to assemble ourselves together from time to time. But if you go back and read the Old Testament, folk wasn't in church like this 24-7 like we do. They just weren't. You know, they had particular seasons and times in seasons that they went and corporately went together, almost like you see the Muslims do when they go to Mecca. There were certain seasons and times where you, where you devoted and blocked out that time specifically and only to celebrate the Lord and his goodness and greatness to you in a corporate way. But it wasn't, you know, Sabbath, in essence, was a day of rest. As the word says, it says six days since a man has worked, but the seven days of rest. Now, I've always had the question, how are you going to rest when you're in church all day? And again, I'm not, I, I don't want you guys to misinterpret this. I want you guys to go back and say, well, Mr. Simmons says, you know, we shouldn't be going to church. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that some of the stuff that we do is of man. It's not of God. All these things added on to people, all these different kind of offerings and so forth. And then people taking the offerings in the Old Testament and put them out of context. It's to line their pockets. Yeah, I heard people talking about the first fruit offerings and all that kind of stuff. Okay, where, where did Yahashua Hamashiach talk about that? Where did he talk about the first fruit offering? All these things that we're, we're doing. And then when the first fruit offering comes, it gets back to the main thing. Most of the offerings that God developed for man to have were designed to bless other men and women. You guys heard me talk about the tithing. Tithing, if you go look at it, go look in the Old Testament, the, the reason why tithe came about was for a couple, three main reasons when you read about the tithe. Number one, the tithes are to help bless the Levites. Why? Because God said, I'm not going to give you Levites any inheritance. All the other tribes of Israel all had land uh, and places of prosperity the Lord was going to send them and give to them. But the Levites, he said, nope. He said, because you guys, your primary and only duty is to do and handle the things of worship. So when we finally do have buildings, you guys are going to take care of the, of this, of the building. You guys are going to take care of the, the offerings. Because remember back then, uh, offerings were messy. People were killing cows and goats and all kind of stuff. They had to take all the livestock in, grain offering. They had to handle all that stuff. And he said, that's going to be your full-time duty. 
He said, but good news, the, uh, the rest of the 11 tribes are going to be your inheritance. They're going to be your substance. So that's the first group that was supposed to benefit from the tithes. Second group that was supposed to benefit was that every third year, that the tithes would also be given uh, and, and, and put into God's storehouse. Hence the term, as we found in Malachi, where it says, bring me your meat to my storehouse. Now, I've been talking about this a lot only because the Creflo Dollar situation came up. It just kind of struck me. I was like, you know what, man, for real, for real, um, uh, when I was younger in ministry, I, the thing we used to always get with me, I'd be like a little mischievous child. I'd be in the pulpit, and when they would talk about that, I would be saying, I want I to put my hand up like this and say, excuse me, excuse me, can, can I go see the storehouse? Because we never saw it. We always talked about bringing me meat into my storehouse, and then no church really had a storehouse. And then I found out what the storehouse was. What God was talking about, bring that, that third year tithe to the storehouse. Why? Because what would happen? God said, you bring it all, and at the appointed time, you would invite the Levites. Remember, I just talked about them before. He said, you invite another group of people, the, the, the widows, because, you know, men, uh, husbands took care of their wives. The wives had no real inheritance. There were only a handful of women back in those days that were allowed to inherit uh, wealth from their family passed down to the men. But the men's obligation was when you married a woman, that you were supposed to take care of her. And so when that man died, when a woman became a widow, that was a big deal. She didn't have no sustenance. She was caught out. And they said the other group was the poor. I watch a lot of motivational tapes and a lot of inspirational things right now. They're talk, a lot of them are talking about money and people making a million dollars a month, all that kind of stuff, which is, which is there's no harm if God has empowered you because he did say that the people of Israel, he said, hey, he would give them the ability to get wealth. So I'm not saying in any way that you should not look to try to improve your lot. But however, Yeshua HaMashiach also said this. He said, the poor, you should have with you always. And why is that? Because some people are going to be born with infirmities. Some people are not going to have uh, the capacity uh, to earn. Some people, life is going to beat them down to the point where they just can't recover on their own. And they're going to need help. That's what we come as believers. That's what it, that tithe in the third year comes up with. So when you start to look at these things and look at how man has shifted the things of God away from the people of God, you realize that we have now become those people that, you know, have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So again, number one, we want to lock, lock out the loopholes. No more loopholes about, okay, I'm giving to the church. I'm not taking care of people. Number two, you want to know what you know, what you know. You want to make sure that what you're doing is scripturally based. So in other words, if you, as like I said, no, I tell people there's no problem with the tithing, but understand what the tithing is for. Understand what these different offerings that people are asking to give to, wave offering and, and first fruit offerings. Make sure you understand and know, number one, is this something that God wants you to do? And if so, how, how is it supposed to be handled? Okay, so those are our first two tenets about how not to be a hypocrite and, and not being caught up with, I like to call it the game of Simon Says. Okay, so make sure, again, you lock out the loopholes, none of this idea about you giving the church, you're giving this organization, you can't take care of your own people, uh, specifically your parents. Number two, make sure you, you know that what you're doing is of God. Okay, let's go here to, back to the Old Testament here, and we'll look at Ezekiel and get ready to, to, to wrap up. In Ezekiel 22, 6 and 7, that's what he says. Look, the prince of Israel, each one has used his power to shed blood in you. And you have been made light of father and mother. Then we go back to it again. In the midst, they have oppressed the stranger. In you, they have mistreated the fatherless and the widow. Bam, bam, bam. That's out the Old Testament. God, look at what God was concerned with. He's concerned with, and this is the last thing that I will say here. Be concerned with what God is concerned with, and more importantly, be concerned with whom, whom God is concerned with. Back here, and this is a slight on America. If you read this, okay, and I'm especially speaking to those of you, my brothers and sisters, who fall on, quote unquote, the conservative side of the house when it comes to politics. Look at what God, Jehovah himself, is saying to the people of Israel, specifically to the leaders. He said, look, the princes of Israel, each one has used his power to shed blood in you and you they have made light of father and mother remember that we just told you about uh the scam of not taking care of your parents and giving your stuff to the church and he said in the midst of you they have oppressed a stranger bam 
there we go. Hmm. Number two, pressure strain. I'm going to get on that for just a second. Okay, a lot of people talk about immigration. They're always crying about immigration, all people coming in, blase, blase. And don't be wrong, there should be, if you have laws in the land, the law should be obeyed. However, if we peel back the onion, a lot of the people are coming to this nation because there's opportunity. People are trying to feed their family. And the other thing, too, if we're honest, how many of you right here listening to me, especially all those of you who have homes, have said, I'm not going to throw a slam on anybody. This is what people have actually said. I'm going to get me a Mexican. <laughs> because they're going to come in here and do good work, and I'm going to pay them on the cheap. And, you know, they do it for a reasonable cost. They're cheaper than Joe Landscape or Joe Builders. So I'm going to call him. And most of you know that the reason why they're so expensive is because they're here legally. So guess what they're not doing? They're not having to take out uh, Social Security tax. And they're not paying tax, Medicare tax, all that kind of stuff that the other agencies have to pay. It can be a lot less expensive in terms of charging you. So at the end of the day, what we have to say to ourselves and understand that the reason why these people come here is because we caused them to come here. Matter of fact, there, there are many uh, things like your poultry and farming in various areas like California, Georgia, and other places. They're looking for people who are immigrants to work and to do labor that the average American don't want to do. So, but the Lord says when that stranger, that, that person, that alien, that immigrant comes, he said you don't oppress them. You don't do that. Now, before you go sideways, I'm not talking about somebody who's up to, to illegal activities. Nobody's saying to cobble somebody. Nobody's saying that you shouldn't obey the rules. But in fact, don't blame the victim, okay, for the situation. Because remember now, many people are coming because they know they can find work. You and I, in many cases, have provided that work for them. So don't get mad when they don't want to leave. Don't get mad if they need health care, medical care. Don't oppress them. Don't beat them down. Why? Because this country has basically invited people to come in here. Also, to those of you who are a little bit more conservative, let's be honest. Oftentimes, you are more pleased about people that are the fairer skin coming here than people of the darker skin. And you make it hard for the people of the darker skin to come in. That's oppressing the stranger. Just saying. And last but not least, what do you say? You must treat the fatherless and the widow. And I can get I can get deep on this, especially as I do sports, and talk about the fact that we have built a sports marketing injury uh, industry on the backs of the children of single parents across this nation, especially African American single parents, because out of that cauldron of stress and crime, it has honed and made guys that are ferocious on the field of endeavor of sports. Because why? They're trying to get the heck out of that neighborhood and get prosperity to their parents. That's a whole other issue. Listen, everybody, our time is gone. We have to wrap it up. We thank you so much for watching the broadcast here. Again, my name is Minister Jonathan Simmons. You've been watching Preaching in the Park. Uh, if you want to find out more about us, here's our website, consideredwordministries.org. You also can reach me uh, on email, helpchurch at gmail.com. Follow me anywhere on social media, at Minister J. Sim. That's Minister, the letter J, S-I-M-M. Or call our virtual phone number, 678-304-8121. You know, before I leave the broadcast, I want to ask you, do you know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior? I'll tell you, please, man, please, sir, get to know him today. Why? Nobody loves you like Jesus. Not your mom, not your baby, not your boo, not your BFF. He died for you. That's right. He died for your sins. But he rose from the dead. And when he did that, he has now to offer two great things to you. If you confess your sins and believe that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead, two wonderful things happen. Number one, you become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. And number two, you become an adoptive child of God with all the rights therein. That means that you now can go to God as your father, ask him for anything that you need or desire, and according to his will, he'll give it to you. And if and when you die, you go to that wonderful place called heaven where everything is beautiful, it's wonderful, light, cheery, no bad people, no pain, no pandemic, no politics, no protests. You never get old, you never die, and you stay away from that unhappy place called hell where everything that's in heaven is not in hell. So it's bad people everywhere. It stinks, it's dark, it's dreary. Cut off from God and all the people you love forever and a day. I don't know about you, like option number one is to have option number two. All right, everybody, until the next time, God bless you and have a wonderful rest of your day. So long now.